Hello and welcome to another edition of Physics 321 Lecture Tutorials. I'm Dr. Steve Brule. Today we're going to study the effective potential in orbits. But first we'll review the main points from our previous lesson by considering a simulation of the two-body problem from the rest frame and then from the center of mass frame. Then we'll solve the Lagrangian for the one-body problem and see that angular momentum is constant. But we already knew that. We'll write the total energy function for the one-body problem in terms of the effective potential for the orbit problem. <clears throat> we'll see that we obtain an effective force that has a repulsive component when we consider the total energy from the uh, perspective of the effective potential. And finally, we'll consider the effective potential as an analogy to the real potential function for a diatomic molecule. Okay, well let's first take a moment to review the big ideas from the two-body problem we learned in our last lesson. Okay, what follows is a video of the two bodies, these two bodies moving in response to a central force of gravity that pulls them together. Notice that body 1 of mass 20 um, starts with zero velocity over here and mass 2 which is half as massive as the heavy body starts with a velocity that's pointing up in this direction so what's going to happen is since we have initial linear momentum the whole system is going to move off into that direction because we're not in the center of mass frame we're going to be from the rest frame okay all right, here we are in video land, and we're going to watch these two gravitational masses revolving around one another as they move in response to the central force, the central gravitational force that acts between them. Notice that I'm starting the mass 2, the lighter body, with a velocity of 40 in the x, 20 in the y, and the velocity of the heavier mass is at rest when we start this simulation. Here we go. And we watch the motion unfold from our rest frame on Earth. It looks quite complicated from a rest frame. Isn't that interesting? The motion just keeps repeating itself we see that the mass 1 comes up to a peak and stops and right about there repeats from the initial conditions that it started with and then here we go again we'll get to the same initial conditions once again right about there and then the whole sequence repeats itself Okay, let's draw a center line between the two bodies as they move, like we did in the center of mass case in our previous lesson, and see what it reveals about the complex two-body motion. Okay, so we're just going to draw a center line between these two uh, bodies as they move along. Last time we did this, the center line always crossed at that same point, which was the center of mass. But now not so clear what's happening. Well let's repeat that exercise but this time we'll mark the location of the center of mass for every one of those uh, iterations and we'll see what's happening to the center of mass. Note that the center of mass is one-third of the way along the center line closer always to the massive body than to the uh, less massive body. Okay, so I put the center of mass close to the massive body away from the less massive body, a third of the way. There it is again. It's closer now because these two things are closer. There it is again, close to the massive body. You see what we're doing. Just keep doing those for every one. And I think you see the pattern that is evolving here. This video took me about two hours to uh, create and about 
20 seconds to implement here. Um, the center of mass, look at this. At the center of mass, each one of these points moved along a straight line. And that's what we derived in our last lesson. If I had been able to stop the, uh, that simulation exactly at um, even intervals, you would see all these points would be equidistant from one another. But they kind of jump around a little bit because sometimes I missed the uh, timing a little bit. Okay, in our last lesson we learned that the two-body kinetic energy uh, could be divided into an orbit and spin component similar to how we did it with the rigid body. I didn't mention it in the last video, but that's what we're doing. It looks just like the rigid body angular momentum where we're uh, dividing it into an orbit and a spin component. Well, if we change the frame of reference, which we did in the last video, we say that r dot is equal to zero if we're moving along with the center of mass frame, because then we're, you know, the relative motion between us and the center of mass is zero, so we can say r dot is zero, so we can ignore this term because it goes to zero. Um, well, let's go back to the simulation program, which I got from the PHET site. And adjust the simulation to view the system uh, that we just simulated from the center of mass reference frame instead of the rest frame that we just uh, saw. Okay, now we're going to view the same system, but now from the center of mass frame of reference. And I do that by clicking a little button in the simulation program that says uh, go to the center of mass reference frame. Okay, so here we go. As we watch the two bodies move along, they appear to be orbiting the center of mass. And one thing that's very interesting is that the heavier body, this yellow one, uh, in the rest frame, it stopped when it got to the very top point in its trajectory, right? there when we were looking at that from the reference frame, but now it's never stopping. It just keeps on going because we're subtracting the velocity of the center of mass from the motion of these two bodies. Okay, um, in the center of mass inertial reference frame, it's an inertial reference frame, but it's not a... Um, rest frame. It's moving at a constant speed, but it's still an inertial reference frame. The two bodies appear to orbit about the center of mass. This is actually from the video we did last time. So there they are. They're both moving around that common center of mass if we view the system from the center of mass reference frame. And that's what we're always going to do when we uh, solve this orbit problem. So the kinetic energy of the system can be written just in terms of that term, the spin part of the kinetic energy. <clears throat> and then we write this quantity right here, this is in the last video, as mu, which is the reduced mass of the two-body system. And I just want to point out um, that the vector, the r vector between the two, in the two-body problem changes in both magnitude and direction as the two bodies orbit that center of mass point. So you see that red vector changing in both length and direction as the two bodies orbit. So once we have the kinetic energy in the center of mass frame, it's easy to pose a Lagrangian in terms of that radial vector, where we just have that as our gravitational potential. And the miraculous fact that we learned in our last video was that the two-body problem is exactly analogous to the one-body problem. The only difference is that in the two-body problem, the mass that you use in the Lagrangian is this reduced mass. But otherwise, it looks exactly like the Lagrangian for a one-body system, like a comet orbiting the sun. And since the one-body and two-body systems are essentially equivalent, if we solve the Lagrangian for the one body, we'll have the solution for both systems. And that's what we're going to do in this lesson. We're going to solve the Lagrangian for the one body problem, and then in class we will um, uh, generalize that to the two body problem, and we'll consider some two body problems, but really the solution, once we have that, we've got the solution to both. Okay.
So we know that we need two coordinates to describe the position in the one body problem. We're going to use r and theta. We're going to use uh, polar coordinates. We write the potential energy of the system just as the familiar gravitational potential energy, which depends on the distance between the two gravitational masses. If we had the two-body problem, it would just be this r vector is change. You know, the position of each one is changing, but it's um, well, we've already said that. <clears throat> so how can we write the kinetic energy of the system? Well, the kinetic energy is just uh, kinetic energy in polar coordinates. Here are the two unit vectors in polar coordinates. And the velocity in the r direction is just r dot times the, the position vector in polar coordinates. And then the, the angular term of the velocity, this is the tangential, you could call that the tangential velocity, is just r omega. Uh, so the net velocity in polar coordinates is just the sum of those two components. And then if we want the magnitude of the velocity squared, we just use Pythagoras' theorem. So there we have it. We can substitute those two terms in for well, we have the radial component of the kinetic energy and the angular component of the kinetic energy term. So we've just written the kinetic energy for the a Lagrangian, and I just simplified it right there. So here's the Lagrangian in terms of r dot and theta dot. Uh, we can write the r equation, and uh, you did this on a, an exam recently, I believe. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details of that, but we set the time derivative of the generalized momentum equal to the generalized force, and we get this equation. And then we write the theta equation based on this Lagrangian. And uh, we find that since there are no thetas in the Lagrangian, it's an, theta is an ignorable coordinate, which means that, <clears throat> well, there's two ways to think about it. You could go ahead and take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity to get the generalized momentum, which is really the angular momentum for this system. Then take the time derivative, like you kind of just do by rote now, and then set that equal to the generalized force, which was zero, so you'd get this differential equation, but then you end up with a second order differential equation. So the easy way and the way that we uh, use to solve the orbit problem is to set the, since we know that the uh, time derivative of this quantity is going to be zero, that means that that quantity itself must be a constant with respect to time. And we call that constant the angular momentum of the system. Yeah, that's the angular momentum of the, of the system. And it, you, I put L naught there because it's the initial angular momentum, but it, it is the same because since angular momentum is conserved, whether I have measured the angular momentum at the initial point or any point along the orbit, the angular momentum will still be the same constant value. Okay, so we ended up with these two equations from solving the Lagrangian problem. Um, we can solve for theta dot in this equation. We get this equation. And then we plug this in for the theta dot over here. And we end up with this equation for our r double dot, which is now independent of theta dot because we were able to solve for it in that equation. So here's our r double dot equation written uh, now without the theta dot term because we substituted. And the nice thing about that is we've got these two coupled differential equations now. They're coupled because each one has r in it. Mm -hmm. And we could, so we could use those equations to simulate the, um, the uh, motion of a one-dimensional system, and it's really the same for two or for a uh, I should have said the one-body problem, and it's the same as the two-body problem as we know. Mm -hmm. And we will use this solution in class to uh, simulate some orbits later. Okay. Well, there's an interesting way astronomers use to conceptualize the orbit problem as a curvilinear, actually it's a linear, one-dimensional system. And uh, any student who takes 
theoretical mechanics like you are doing this semester, you should know this derivation. This is like the uh, derivation that it occurs in every theoretical mechanics course in the universe. Okay, so here's the kinetic energy we just uh, derived for the one body system. It has the, uh, the radial component and the uh, angular component. Um, we knew from the, uh, when we solved the theta Lagrange equation, we ended up with this as a constant, and we were able to then solve for theta dot in terms of the angular momentum, the constant angular momentum of the system in R. And then we can substitute now for theta dot uh, over here. So we're doing this just for the kinetic energy and so that we have this nice uh, equation that we can write that's just in terms of our variables for the kinetic energy. Now if we pose the total energy for the system, we have this radial component of the kinetic energy, the angular component of the kinetic energy, and then here is your potential. So that's very simple. We're just posing the uh, total energy for the orbiting system, the one body system. Now here is the big deal here. We're, all we do is we change the way we think about potential. If instead of thinking of this component, which it really is part of the kinetic energy, but see it's it's a constant over the radius. So that is like if I put that in with my potential term, then I just have over here, I just have some constants and functions of R. So that looks like a U of R, doesn't it? So we call that, when we think of this, we lump the angular part of the kinetic energy in with the potential, we think of that as the effective potential for the system. And if you think back to uh, section 4.6, we learn that when we have linear one-dimensional systems, we learn that it's easy to plot the uh, potential energy function for that system and then visualize the behavior of the system by imagining where you are along the uh, potential energy curve. Well, this is a big deal because all we're going to do is uh, plot the potential energy function, or I should say the effective potential energy function for some orbiting comet, which is analogous to a two-body problem, as we know. And then once we plot that effective potential that is a function of this initial angular momentum of the system, then we can take a look and see how the, the system will evolve if we start it at some uh, initial potential energy, or effective potential energy, perhaps, I should say. Okay. Well, before we consider the motion and look at the different orbits, they're called the Kepler orbits, um, that are generated by uh, orbiting objects. Let's take a moment to explore an analogy based on the effective potential that astrophysicists often use when thinking about orbits. And it's not just astrophysicists, this comes up in quantum too. So you'll see that again when you take quantum mechanics. If we take the negative gradient of the effective potential, which was this, remember, we can think in terms of, a, of an effective forcing function. So I just took the negative gradient of the effective potential and I get this as the forcing function. Well that forcing function is composed of this term which is the familiar um, gravitational attractive force just minus you know the universal gravitational force times the radial vector so it's pointing in towards uh, the center of the uh, orbit. And uh, then this term is the odd one that we got from taking the partial derivative of, of that, which is we know in reality it's the angular term of the kinetic energy. But if we think of that as part of the effective potential, then we end up getting this, it's a fictitious force. It doesn't really exist in nature, but it's, it's this thing that we can imagine if we're imagining this as our effective potential. And people do this all the time, so get used to it. So And it's repulsive because it's positive. This term is positive times the radial direction, so it's going to be a repulsive force. 
So when, if we were thinking about an orbiting comet, we can imagine two forces acting on the comet as it's orbiting. First, the gravitational force is pulling it towards the sun, but then there is this fictitious repulsive force that's pushing it away from the sun. So when it gets, and since it's r cubed, if r is small, then this term is going to dominate for small r's, and this term will dominate for large r's. So people think of um, the angular momentum as it creates a repulsive force. It's really a fictitious force, but it's uh, it would be a repulsive force if we're considering this as our effective potential. Mm -hmm. Well, it's easier to, to think about this if we think of this in terms of an analogy with a diatomic molecule. So this is just an HCl molecule. And let's explore that analogy for a second. So we can consider the potential energy function for the uh, HCl molecule. In this case, the potential energy function is derived from the sum of two forces. One force we would get is an attractive, and if we pull these two molecules, or these two atoms apart, they're attractive because there's a covalent bonding force that pulls them back together. And if we push them together beyond their equilibrium point, then there is a repulsive Coulomb force because they are pushed apart by the... Uh, nuclei, I guess. The forcing gives rise to this linear uh, one-dimensional potential function. Okay, so here's the potential function that looks just like the uh, effective potential function for an orbiting uh, comet or whatever. Well, what do you think the significance of point C is in terms of our analogy with the diatomic molecule? Why don't you press pause and think about that and then come back. Okay, well, if we're going back to uh, section 4.6 and we imagine putting a particle in that potential well and then we put it right there at the bottom, what is, what is it going to do? It's just going to sit there. So uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, the two atoms here, the hydrogen and the chlorine atom, chlorine atom, will just not vibrate. They'll just sit there and not move. Why is u r equal to zero when uh, r is goes to infinity? Well, if we take these two things apart, well then the potential energy is zero, and that's how we define our zero point, which is arbitrary. But that's what we always do with gravity and with this. What is the significance of the other point where u equals zero? Is the force zero there? And students always want to say zero. Why don't you press positive? I mean. <laughs> Why don't you press pause and see what you think the force should be right at that point. Well, welcome back. Um, we know that the, uh, the forcing here is going to be pushing the two, uh, these two atoms apart at that point because we have a very sharp gradient there, don't we? So if we released, if we released the system at that particular radius, what's going to happen is the radius is going to, you know, go, the system will evolve like that, and the radius will increase because it falls along here. And it, how far will it increase? It'll go out to infinity because it'll eventually get up to uh, zero. The energy will get up to zero again, or the potential. Mm hmm. Why does the molecule vibrate when E is less than zero? So if we start our system right here at that particular radius and let it evolve, well, then the radius is going to increase out to here. So that's our turning point, and then it'll come back, and it'll keep oscillating back and forth. It won't be a harmonic oscillation, but it will oscillate back and forth between these two radii. Well, what would happen if we started the molecule at this particular radius? So we're really squeezing these two things together, really close together, and there's a lot of energy uh, stored in the bond and its uh, repulsive force. So we let go of it, the radius increases, and it zooms apart, and then the uh, molecule breaks apart. Okay, well, this is going to be analogous to our 
orbit situation. So what if we have, now let's switch our minds and think of a, a comet orbiting around the sun or, or maybe any satellite orbiting around any parent body. Well, what would happen if the system was started at the lowest uh, effective potential energy? Mm -hmm. Well, that means that the total energy of the system at the lowest effective potential, then that means that the, well, for one thing you know is that the radius is going to be constant. Just like it was with the diatomic molecule, when we started it at the lowest uh, energy, then it didn't oscillate back and forth. It was only when we started out with some potential like that that it went back and forth be uh, on either side of that equilibrium point. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean for an orbiting satellite? If we started at the lowest uh, effective potential point, then we're going to have a constant radius. And do you know what it looks like when you have a constant radius and you have something orbiting? It's a circular orbit. There's the radius, doesn't change, and uh, there it would be. That would be a comet in a perfectly circular orbit around the sun if we started it at its lowest effective potential uh, point. What sort of orbit would you expect if the total energy was less than zero but not minimum? Okay, so now we're going to start at some minimum radius, and then it will slosh out here to some maximum radius, and then go back and forth. <clears throat> well, then we're going to end up with an elliptical orbit. We'll see in future video. And um, Okay, so now that we know that it's an elliptical orbit, let's see if we can match points in the elliptical orbit to points in the uh, effective potential as the system evolves. So what's the effective kinetic energy if we were starting the system out right here at its minimum radius. So here is in our orbit right here, there's the point where the radius is minimum. Well, what do you think the kinetic energy, the effective kinetic energy would be at that particular point? Press pause and think about that and then come back. Okay, well what you should have thought of, well you know that the it doesn't have zero kinetic energy because it's going to have a velocity in that direction. But that velocity is the radial velocity. That contributes to the radial component of the kinetic energy. And that's over here, and we're calling that part of our effective potential. So when we're just calling this as our effective kinetic energy, that means that the effective kinetic energy only has the r dot term, and the r dot is not changing there. So r dot will be zero at that point. The radius is getting smaller, 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 and it's getting bigger, bigger, bigger as it goes beyond that point. So right at that point, the velocity is zero. It's a turning point. Okay. That's interesting. Um, how about this point? Press pause and think about it. This is the maximum radius. Welcome back. So... Uh, by the same reasoning, this is another turning point. The radius was getting larger, 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 and then it gets smaller, 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 smaller. So the uh, effective uh, radial kinetic energy is zero at that point. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. And uh, where is the satellite when its effective kinetic energy is maximum? So the effective kinetic energy will be a maximum when the effective potential is at a minimum. So we know that we start with some total energy, which is no kinetic energy at that point, as an, the system oscillates, and then it would have no kinetic energy at this turning point here. But then when it gets to the lowest potential energy point in the effective potential there, then the kinetic energy would be at its maximum. So, um, well, we could find out where the uh, lowest R is, and we could find what the R would be, and I don't, I bet it's not that point. It's going to be something like that, I bet, but we don't know. Well, what did we do this um, 
lesson. We reviewed the main points from our previous lesson by considering a simulation of the two-body problem from the rest frame and then from the COM frame. Then we solved the Lagrangian and arrived with that equation for theta dot because the angular momentum was a constant. We wrote the total energy function for the one-body problem in terms of effective potential. That's really the focus of this whole show. And we saw that we could obtain the effective force by taking the negative gradient of the effective potential, which gave rise to a fictitious repulsive force that was that thing. And finally, we looked at the analogy between the potential energy function for an orbiting satellite and the potential energy function for a diatomic molecule. See you next time.